We are everywhere. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Quint, India's first digital live streaming business news service. I'm Neeraj Shah and you're watching Indian Open. Let's go straight to the headlines. The coronavirus death toll climbs to 132 with 5,974 cases of infection reported in China alone, overtaking the SARS epidemic. Governments have tightened international travel and border crossings with China. U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer will visit India this month to finalize a trade deal, reports Bloomberg. This would be ahead of President Donald Trump's expected visit. The government asks all public sector banks to set up a committee of senior officers to monitor progress of pending fraud cases against employees. And Bajaj Finance and Pair and Bajaj FinServe are the two nifty companies coming out with numbers today. Well, the trade setup for the day, um, uh, the U.S. markets bounce back from the levels that they were at or the, for the Dow essentially, the biggest loss that they had since October day before yesterday, they've bounced back and bounced back quite smartly for the Nasdaq as well, led by Apple of course, one and a half percent higher, but that had its move and bearings on some of the others as well. So earnings led uptick for the U.S. markets. And it's probably reflecting in part on the Asian screen as well. While China remains shut still Monday, the rest of the pack, Hang Seng down 2.5, Nikkei up, the other regional markets, Kospi Australia not having that bad a day as they had yesterday. And the SGX Nifty points towards a start, uh, which is likely about a third of a percent. Now, while LME continues to grind lower, crude has shown a bit of a bounce. The question is whether this is sustainable because we have a day of a bounce back in line with what's happening to US markets. Crude too has moved up. But can the rebound sustain? Really difficult. Most people predicting NYMEX headed, headed close to about $50 uh, to a barrel. So don't quite know if this will last. But for now, we have that spit of a sustenance in crude prices. What does all of this do for the trading day today? That's the key question. Now, because of the global bounce, there could be a near term um, assistance for our markets and the broader markets could once again have a day of our performance. It's a, it's a day full of results, full of uh, broader end of the spectrum results and therefore uh, key to monitor that if indeed that sentiment around the quarterly number stays good, they might actually have the nifty mid cap or the BSE mid cap and the BC small cap indices do well. So that is one thing you've got to watch out for. But I would also reckon that the near term set of events today, tomorrow, day after and Saturday could keep volatility high. We'll have the Fed outcome come late this, after, late this evening and therefore our markets will react to that tomorrow morning if at all there is a change. There is also the FNO expiry that we have to contain with tomorrow. That is the Brexit. Uh, event on Friday and of course we'll have the union budget on Saturday so it's a packed house for the next four days and you got to keep in mind that this will naturally keep volatility high maybe some very large positions taking also uh, may not happen so you got to keep that at the back of your mind as I said today's a packed day for results not as much for the index because it's Bajaj Finance and Bajaj Swinserve so the Bajaj twins come out with numbers and in all likelihood while finance will come out during market hours Finserve may well come out post market hours but an important set of numbers to watch out for. But the broad end of the spectrum has a clutch of names and out of the 14, 15 odd important ones, I've chosen the six that I think we'll keep an eye out for. Tata Power and naturally so one of the largest power companies. But Dixon Tech, the stock has been trading at new highs and very important set of numbers to monitor as well from a sentiment perspective as is GCPL and people will be eyeing the volume growth there. Or Pidilite, again, Escorts um, with, the, with the kind of iffy October, November, December months, what happens there? And Jubilant Food Works after the same store sales growth numbers by Westlife. And the fact that there's one more QSR num uh, company that has gotten the IPO, what Jubilant Food Works does in the quarter would be important. The stock corrected a bit yesterday, so it's an important stock to monitor too. But all of these will come out during market hours. What about market open today? And again, a clutch of numbers that will react, a clutch of stocks that will react to numbers. I've chosen the three or four most important ones according to me. Uh, firstly, Reliance, and the reason I bring this up is because the stock has corrected quite 
quite a lot already from those levels of nearly 1600 to 1471 yesterday macquarie's come out with a downgrade note with a target price of 1300 but i want to bring it to your notice that the stock has already had a bit of a correction and a steep one at that the last few days so you got to keep that at the back of your mind when you look at this note look at that seven days about four percent but from the recent highs about eight nine percent so got to keep that at the back of your mind tata coffee interesting numbers revenue growth not too much just about seven and a half but EBITDA numbers were strong, lower, lower raw material cost and other expenses, lower other expenses aided the margins as a result of which the net profit went up 2.2 times. So it's an interesting stock, uh, well traded as well. Would be interesting to see if this one reacts to these numbers. As also JK Lakshmi, because again, while revenues were not up too much, EBITDA numbers up, net profit up 3.3x. Um, good numbers and margins improved due to lower power and transportation costs. Again, a company which didn't have top line growth but showed uh, some pricing discipline and cost discipline. And maybe even in the case of JK Lakshmi Cement, you might actually have the stock reacting a bit. So, Tata Coffee and JK Lakshmi Cement are two names that you were to watch out for. Spandana Spurti, the other one, wherein the net interest income went up about 43%, net profit up about 40 odd percent, and the AUM was about uh, AUM growth was about 40%. So, you got to keep that at the back of your mind. Good numbers uh, provided by this one too. Last but not the least, I would watch out for Westlife. While the stock has been on a bit of a roll off late, but the Burger King franchisee gets the approval for an IPO. That typically brings about a bit of a spurt in some of the related companies as well. Uh, Westlife a lot more profitable than NDT as compared to Burger King. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of valuations Burger King gets and therefore if there's a rub-off effect on Westlife. So do watch out for this as well. Okay, let's tell you what's lined up on First Word today. Collection of the top editorial stories that we want to bring to you. Indigo promoter Rakesh Gangwal has called for an extraordinary general meeting of the shareholders today. Swamad will tell us what's on the agenda and the importance of this EGM. Bajaj Finance is expected to report strong growth even amidst the stress in the larger economy. Shef Ali Malik will bring us the expectations. Seth Klarman of the Bopost Group reiterates his belief in value investing. I'll get you some excerpts of his latest letter to shareholders. And... Um, well, we'll watch out for some of the other things as well during the course of the trading day today. Start off with Interglobe Aviation, which will hold an extraordinary general meeting today. Rakesh Gangwal has sought some amendments to the company's rules that could end his dispute with co-promoter Rahul Bhatia once and for all. Samit Sarkar is standing by to tell us what's on the agenda and its potential implications for the airline. Samit, why has the RG Group called for this meeting? Well, uh, the EGM is requested by the Rakesh Gangwal Group to amend the articles of association so that the promoters can sell their stake in the company that is Interglobe Aviation, the parent company of Indigo. Now, earlier the two promoter groups, that is Abhatia and the Gangwal Group, signed a shareholder agreement in April 2015 which placed a restriction on transfer of the equity stake and or acquisition of new stake in the company. Now, the state restriction was in place for four years from the date of Indigo's IPO, which ended on November 10th, 2019. And hence, this EGM has been moved by the Rakesh Gangwal Group. So, if the resolution in the EGM is passed, then the Gangwal Group could look to sell its full or majority stake of, in the company, thereby removing the overhang of the promoter dispute. Now, the Gangwal Group currently owns nearly 36.6% stake in the company, which is valued at close to 21,000 crore rupees. And why this is an overhang? Because this dispute among the promoters uh, has led to a fall in the share price of Indigo are of nearly 5% since the first time this reports of promoted dispute has been reported. And this is despite a strong financial performance reported by the company over the same time period. And that is the reason why today's EGIM is so important for the company and for the shareholders and for the investors. Hmm. So, Amit, are there any uh, uh, things that one should watch out for? And, you know, assuming that this proposal is passed and the Rakesh Gangwal Group is allowed to sell their stake, <coughs> Any sense about who the potential buyers could be? Well, firstly, Rahul Bhatia, who is the co-founder and the promoter of the company, uh, who and currently owns nearly 38% stake in the company, might be interested in buying some stake through using its right, a right of first refusal that he has. Now, this could be done by him to avoid a presence of an another strong investor on the board and uh, and the issues that he had faced earlier with Rakesh Gangwal. So, to avoid that, he can increase his stake up to 45% from current level of 38%. The second possible buyer could be Qatar Airways. Now, as time and again they have shown their interest in the company now they had first shown their interest in 2015 and uh, sometime back also the CEO had clearly said that they are keen to buy as much as stake possible in the company now recently Qatar and Indigo also signed a one-way code share agreement which according to Indigo 
could be converted into a two way depending on the success of this one way code agreement also qatar owns stake in other airlines like china south airline uh, cathay pacific air italy international airline rooms and uh, uh, latin uh, latam airlines so this could be one of the potential buyer that is qatar airways secondly similar to qatar airways the us based delta airways uh, delta airlines could also be a potential buyer as they are looking to increase their presence in the strong aviation uh, in the good growth of the aviation market in india now this company also owns stake in various other global airlines like air mexico virgin atlantic air fan f f france uh, china eastern and other companies uh, so these three could be the potential buyers for uh, rakesh gangwal's uh, stake in indigo okay and i heard you mention yesterday when the numbers came out that people were largely bullish but the stock had an indifferent behavior as we head into this egm how are analysts viewing the stock well i'll tell about tell you about the first valuations that are currently present if you see the current 12 month forward uh, ev to ebitda of indigo now that stands at around 7.7 times now this is at a discount to its previous average of 12 times now this average is since the listing of indigo that was done in 2015 the average has been around 12 times but currently the share is trading at around 7.7 times and one of the major overhangs on the share price of interglobe aviation has been this promoter dispute but a possible resolution among the promoters could take the valuations higher going forward now the 12 month consensus target price for indigo if you see that suggest only a potential upside of 10% but the recent calls from the big brokerage house do suggest a potential upside of nearly 25 to 40% for indigo now morgan stanley has a target price of 2057 rupees ambit capital has a uh, target of 9 uh, 1993 credit suisse icici securities and cimb have a target price in the range of 1800 rupees to 1900 rupees so these target price do suggest a potential upside of 25 to 40% and all of these brokerages have said that a potential overhang on the Share price has been this promoted dispute. So if it resolves today, uh, if it won't resolve today, obviously signs, uh, of signs of resolution. If we get today, it could be a, uh, we could see some upside coming in for Indigo from current levels because if you will see the crude prices that have come off significantly. So that's a positive for an airline company because nearly one third of the cost is related to crude prices. So there are positives for Indigo, but it has not the share price has not been moving because of this promoted dispute. So you're saying, Samit, there are near term triggers so in terms of crude prices, and if indeed this promoter dispute shows. Shows some signs of resolution. Uh, a long-term overhang on the stock might also go away. That's the sum and substance of what exactly, analysts are exactly. saying. Exactly. Okay. Well, we'll watch out for Interglobe Aviation uh, today. Thanks a lot, Samit, for putting that into perspective. It's been a busy one for Interglobe Aviation, I must say. And, and if indeed the meeting outcome happens post market hours today, it'll be interesting to analyze this yet again tomorrow. But it's just that kind of a stock, right? India's largest airline per se by market share in the private side, and therefore an important one to assess as well. One month returns of about eight and a half percent hasn't done too badly, but still has that overhang of the promoter dispute. If that goes away. maybe just maybe that's a positive okay on to some on to a company that doesn't have any of such issues bajaj finance it's expected to report a 40% growth in profits in the december quarter remember this comes at a time when the larger financial system in india is facing a slowdown in credit growth and stress in certain pockets shefali is standing by with the analyst expectations and shefali a, a word on how do the expectations compare with what the management had given out in the update that they now usually give at the start of the quarter um well let's start with the expectations sure. the nii uh, that's expected to inch up 25% and profit that's expected to go up uh, 40% to 1482 crores and um, the update that they had given uh, was that uh, aums uh, grew 35% on a yy basis and 7.15% on a sequential basis so that's um, pretty much um, in line with the expectations only and the customer franchise stood at 40 million versus 32.6 on a yy basis and 38. Seven on a sequential basis, so that continues to go up. In fact, some of the other parameters as well looked uh, were much higher in during this quarter. New loans booked uh, were 7.7 million versus 6.6 on a sequential basis and 6.8 on a YY basis. In fact, the their pace of acquiring customers also went up, probably because of the new festive customer. season. Yes, mm -hmm. so the company acquired 2.5 million new customers in this quarter in Q3 versus 1.9. in the second quarter so that uh, that's quite a jump on a sequential basis apart from that uh, we can also look forward to the margins figure because of the benefit of uh, capital raise will come in 
So that is one. And um, aside of that also the cost of funds overall has come down uh, in this quarter. So um, the other day, just one or two days back only I was uh, speaking to one of the financial entities. Um, they were also able to raise their funds much more easily in this quarter which reflected in their higher margins. For many financial entities, I have seen the margins pick up in this particular quarter. So for, for Bajaj Finance also, they, they obviously they enjoy much lesser cost of funds. So that might look even much better in this quarter considering the systemic liquidity has improved for, for almost everybody. And um, then uh, we can look forward to uh, the higher credit costs. So even though they converted their Carvey exposure into a stake, uh, but then also in terms of accounting, they will have to take that on their books as an NPA mm -hmm. and hence uh, the required provisioning. So we look forward to the higher credit cost because of that. And um, uh, Mr. Bajaj already spoke at Davos uh, in an interview with us uh, that uh, the growth has sort of uh, um, bottomed out and it's only picking up from here on. Uh, but still it's much lesser than um, what they used to see earlier. Um, the rates of 30, 30, 30 to 50 odd percent, it's still much lesser than that but he's hopeful that probably we can see something in the budget that uh, lifts all these companies out of this. Okay, just one follow up to Bajaj Finance, uh, Shifali. Uh, they, the, the expectation of the growth numbers, I mean everybody's been talking about how the system is wide open for some of the high quality names. If indeed they report the numbers that they are reporting, which is steady state and nothing extraordinary, would it be safe to assume that the asset quality deterioration, save for what could happen to Carvey, will actually be almost pick and span or could there be some concerns there? As, is anybody talking about that? I'm sorry, I didn't get your question. No, what I was asking was, is, are there any concerns around the asset quality, save for the Carvey episode, because Bajaj mm -hmm. Finance is able to pick and choose the segments that he wants to grow in. So therefore, mm -hmm. asset quality should largely remain pick and span. Well, yes. Uh, and in fact, two, three quarters back, the management had guided that they have become a little cautious. They've tightened their underwriting uh, standards a bit more. So asset quality issues uh, should not show up uh, much for them. But um, And uh, if from here on, it, it remains to be seen if they pick up their growth but for them asset quality hasn't been much of an Never issue is. and even in uh, most of the other entities which have uh, unsecured portfolios and some of the other portfolios which they are present in uh, the retail NPAs have gone up slightly but largely remain under control largely remain under control that's the key thing so watch out for Bajaj Finance and of course Bajaj FinServe will also come in so that's the number that you need to watch out for well one more MDFC that came out with numbers is M&M Financial which reported strong numbers in the third quarter a lot of positioning into this stock ahead of the numbers Shefali what did you make of these numbers uh, anything that one should watch out for when it comes to M&M Financial uh, oh, well, yes, I was talking about the impact of lower cost of funds. It totally reflected in uh, m, &M financial earnings. Uh -huh. So this is a, um, obviously I've seen it in many, uh, very vocally, uh, I mean, they're saying it, that the, there was an impact of lower cost of funds and their NII inched up 12.5% on a standalone basis. Their PAT went up 15% ahead of the estimates. Their AUMs uh, for the standalone uh, NBFC lending business, that has gone up 31%, uh, sorry, 16% uh, and uh, disbursements were were down 3.8 percent on a YY basis but were actually up 31 percent on a sequential basis so festive season impact coming in there according to the management that's what they've told some of the brokerages loan book is up 12 percent there there's only uh, some deterioration in their asset quality the gross and net NPAs look up on a sequential basis gross NPAs have gone up 60 basis points on a sequential basis but the management is attributing that to a change in the policy in in, uh, in the way uh, they they actually report these numbers They've restated them as a percentage of business assets versus total assets earlier. So because of that, the provisioning also looks higher and there were some one-off elements as well in the provisioning. Apart from that, the coverage ratio that they have that looks slightly, it has gone up on a sequential basis but still uh, looks a bit on the weaker side at 22.9% and uh, margins uh, have gone up to 8.5% versus 8.1% on a sequential basis. So 40 basis point jump uh, as far as the margins are concerned, primarily because of the lower cost of funds and some of the subs, uh, their subsidiaries also seem to have uh, uh, done okay at a consolidated level they've reported a jump of 18 percent when it comes to profit and uh, their insurance subsidiary uh, they've reported their profit is down 12 percent on a YY basis rural housing finance seems to have done well uh, and the management uh, has said also that they have seen some uptick so rural housing finance has actually reported a jump of 17 percent on a YY basis so some uptick being seen there so broker 
brokerages have actually put out a good reaction. Uh, Morgan Stanley is maintaining their target uh, of 425. They're saying key positives were contained NPA formation and uh, stronger margins and thereby PPOP. And MK is saying that uh, uh, the higher than expected profit was mainly because mm -hmm. of the uh, reduction in cost of, runs, uh, cost of funds. And from here on as well, they expect the margins to go up. Something that you alluded to, you're seeing across the NBFC space that cost of funds actually coming off and which might help net interest margins. Yes. Okay, interesting. So, well, we're seeing some patterns across the NBFC space and pretty interesting numbers from MM Financial as well. Thanks, Jeff Ali. We will, of course, watch out for Bajaj Finance as I'm sure the market is watching out for um, a set of numbers that nobody wants to ignore almost every earning season. We end first word with this piece from Seth Klarman. He noted value investor, I don't need to introduce him, of the Bopost Group. In his annual letter to shareholders, reiterated his firm belief in value investing. The chief executive and asset manager of the group, uh, which manages more than $40 billion for the uninitiated, let me tell you that, but grimaces on the underperformance of value equities in 2019, as also the last few years. So here's some things that Seth Klarman lays out in his letter, which I want to bring out uh, for the benefit of our viewers. It was written a day before, uh, so I'm bringing it to you now. Uh, for the factors that impacted the 2019 performance, uh, Klarman says, one, the conservative positioning that they had, Two, the continued un underperformance of value equities, uh, essentially for the U.S. markets, but for world equities at large, I would presume. The persistency of a generally lackluster opportunity set and a few mistakes that they made, which I think would be true for almost anybody which has, who has underperformed in 2019. Uh, though, uh, the interesting bit is he mentions, and I would love, I love this quote in, in, in the in the letter, it's an eight or nine page letter, but one of the things that he says, and says quite well, is he says that sometimes the market tells you one story, even as the performance of the underlying businesses tells you another. This is the case with many value equities today, essentially underlying the fact that even though the underlying business is looking very robust, the market tells you that it is not interested in value equity. So it's telling you a completely different story from what the business performance of some of these value stocks could be looking like. And he, of course, dates this back, not just to 2019, as I said, but to a decade or more of underperformance of value equities. And he mentions the two indices, which is the Russell, 100, Russell 1000 Value Index, which from 2007 on has given returns of about 6.6% .6 versus the Russell Growth Index, which 2007 on has given returns of about 11%. This is essentially from his letter, but certainly shows how value has not quite performed uh, compared to growth. Now, on market learnings, uh, again, uh, something that he says impacts human behavior and therefore stock picking as well, that market cycles can last for a decade or more, but humans tend to experience time in much shorter intervals, which is why many investors uh, don't quite reason well when they are going out and buy. And the worry that he has is that a lot of investors of the, uh, of the current times haven't quite experienced a long-term down cycle or a bear market, and that might come to bite them as and when these markets do turn. Speaking of when the markets could turn, he lays out a bit on the road ahead as well um, on how to play the markets ahead. He's saying that extended valuations alone are not predictive of any kind of imminent collapse. Uh, because elevated multiples can be stretched further if the conditions remain generally benign. And I think by this, he's talking about uh, the cash in the system or the money that is chasing risk assets and equities in general. And if that money flow stays behind, then elevated multiples can be stretched. He also weighs in on what could happen to the U.S. elections outcome and thereby impact on equities, balancing his act. So he's saying that a second term for Donald Trump would potentially be even more volatile than his first term. But he says that in 2020, instead of Donald Trump, if a far left candidate is elected in the US, that would bring in a new and a different set of risks because the policies would change quite dramatically from what Donald Trump has enacted. Maybe taxes go up, maybe populist measures come in, and all of those are something that the markets may not have contended with for the last four years. So both outcomes could have some volatility uh, post the US election verdict is out later this year. Uh, he also weighs in on two very important parameters as I end this piece. One is sitting on cash. Now, uh, he, I, I think in the letter he's mentioned that they are sitting on 31% cash at the end of December. But he's saying that sitting on cash may not be a completely unreasonable uh, thing to do considering what the markets are doing and his own approach to value investing. But he mentions that there is some issue with this as well because sitting on cash would mean 
passing out or passing on the many compelling investment opportunities that are currently available in the markets. Uh, because everything is not only not expensive, but in certain cases, downright bargain price, quote unquote. He's clearly stating that at the current point of time, while it may be tempting to sit on cash, is so much of bargain available that investors might actually be better off putting that money to work in that market. And just to highlight the discrepancy between value and growth and between uh, value companies as well as overpriced companies, he dwells a bit on alternatives, um, unicorns, private equity, etc. So he's saying that the investor exuberance that is a prevalent in the markets, according to him, is best illustrated by the robust fundraising environment for alternative investments. Private equity seems more attractive than it will likely prove to over a full cycle of boom and bust. Again, uh, reiterating the fact that a lot of people haven't quite seen a full cycle of a boom and a bust, and therefore people might be caught napping as well. He, he does uh, mention WeWork as a stark reminder of how quickly the lessons of prior financial bubbles can be forgotten. Uh, referring to the valuation multiples that WeWork had at a point of time in 2019 of 47 billion and how they quickly came down to about $8 billion. So, very interesting note put out. Great read for anybody who's into investing and more so into value investing. So, I urge you to go and read that. But if you don't have access to that, maybe try and just uh, hear out the summary that I laid out for you. Uh, right now. And of course, uh, on almost all of the pieces that we bring to you on First World or otherwise, do try and log into our website, BloombergQuinn.com, and try and read more about those. That's all that we have on First World today, but lots more lined up on Indian Open. For markets and macros with Mihir Wara of Max Life Insurance, important voice to have ahead of the budget. Earnings with VP Nanda Kumar of Manapuram Finance, John Owen of Mastec, and Shalinder Choksi of JK Cement. But after this break, a full tilt towards the day's trade.